morning, good morning. Well, here we are again, the wandering Jew, the practicing Jew, um, a couple of Jews doing it, doing it, doing it every morning as best we can, having a conversation about what in the world is going on. Now, I don't mean what in the world is going on with the virus and so forth and so on. We know all about that. I'm talking about what in the world is going on with these two themes. And there's these two themes that I'm having difficulty with. I've been speaking to Levi Kunin, Rabbi Kunin, now for 20 weeks. And I find myself, as I speak to Rabbi Kunin, hi, Rabbi Kunin, how are you? Good morning. As I speak to him, I, I become not persuaded, I become um, immersed in the conversation that he's bringing to bear on our lives. And so, lo and behold, I sat down to read Torah. And I get to the part in Genesis um, where the flood And that is Hashem gets sick and tired of all the nonsense and he creates a flood and he speaks to Noah and tells him to build an ark. And from best I can recall, the ark took, I don't know, 112 years to build something like this. And um, what Noah is instructed to do is to bring all the animals, the plants, etc., and so forth on the ark, two by two. Male, the female, the male, the female, the male, the female, and I'm presuming it's all of the animals and all of the plants. And we're gonna begin the world anew. Now you've got to understand I'm reading this and I'm listening to the conversation Hashem is having with us, presumably, with Noah, presumably, about what is about to happen. And of course it does happen. And of course everybody on the planet's gone. Everybody in the planet's gone, other than the fish in the sea. And Noah and the ark ends up on the top of a mountain as the waters begin to reside. And then it goes on from there. And it's even worse than it was. So I'm hearing this morality tale, and I'm calling it a morality tale, and please, I've prevented myself from being a cynic. But Levy, it sounds exactly like the kind of story someone would tell when they're attempting to convince me of something. And that someone isn't Hashem, that someone is a bunch of very, very smart people in retrospect telling the story about how all this happened. And in the process, leaving out everything that we know based upon science, based upon natural law, based upon anything and everything, it all disappears in the five books of Moses. It all disappears in the story of the first human being. It all disappears in the story of the first woman. It all disappears in the Garden of Eden. And so it 
said to me, Michael, you've got to speak about this. You got to pose these questions to Rabbi Gunan. Otherwise, you'll be a terrible exemplar for all wandering Jews on the planet and anybody else who has a question about these things. So, Levi, speak to me. Good morning, Rabbi Michal. It's good to see you again, as always. We're recording this today on Lagba Omer, the 33rd day of the Omer, very, very special day on the Jewish calendar, as we spoke yesterday. And I begin with a story about Moshele. He was seven years old. And he was a very, very observant young child, but he ended up in the communist world where he had to join the secular school system. <clears throat> and one day, the teacher focused everyone's attention on Moshele and said, Haha, look at Moshele. Moshe, Moshe believes in a God that you can't see. Could you see God? If you could see God, tell me. And she started to ridicule Moshe. And then after she was done, Moshe turned to the teacher and said, do you have a brain? So she said, of course. He said, show it to me. So she said, I can't. And he had everybody laughing with him. <laughs> Thank you for your question. It's a very, very, very important question. Uh, there's a couple. There's a couple of things that I want to. There's a couple of points that I want to share with you that are very, very important. And I'm not expecting anyone, let, including let yourself. Me, to... let, let me interject just one thing. Um, and I'm to say that you, and, and when I say you, I'm not speaking of you, Levi Kuhn, but you, through. Um, the Rebbe's over 300 years had been responding to this question Correct. over and over and over and over and over and over. Correct. Correct. I've only asked it for the first time. I get it. I understand. I understand. I, and by the way, I didn't, I hope my, my joke was just to open up as it was a joke. It wasn't meant to intend to be an answer to anything. <laughs> no. No, no pun intended. So the point is the following, and I hear you, and it's a very, very important question. There's a, a couple of foundations that are important to be able to place when we go and pursue any knowledge. You know, we can, we can pursue knowledge to a great degree, but if our foundation of that knowledge is weak, we got a problem. <clears throat> you know, Darwin's foundation is very weak. There's, no, there's a very, very weak foundation. In fact, most people don't believe that today in his... In, in his narrative. So let's talk about the foundation of science. The foundation of science is something that we can prove. The foundation of science is something that we can track. And most importantly, the foundation of science is a measurement that we have the beginning and the ending of it. So anywhere we don't have the beginning and the ending of it, it's only a scientific theory. It's not a scientific fact, it's a theory. So there are certain scientific facts and there are great ones that we become aware of, especially in our century, because we know the beginning and the end of the pattern and therefore we can make measurements of how to get to space, etc. But let's take carbon dating for a moment as an example. And carbon dating, we could only measure from the moment that we began to measure carbon dating because we don't have a clue of how something would age if it was a thousand years earlier, what the climate was like, what, what else contributed to the factor of its carbon dating. We don't have that. We can theorize. You could say based on the fact that we measure something for a hundred years, since we began measuring carbon, now we can observe how carbon works in, in general. That, well, that's a theory. That's not a fact. So number one, anything that we know in science is not a contradiction to anything about the narrative of Torah. When one goes to this foundation that I just shared with you, it's not a contradiction. I'm sharing this as a letter from the Rebbe, by the way, answering certain points about the contradiction of science, the seemingly contradiction. There is no contradiction. Science begins where the conversation of Torah puts it forth. There's a creation, there's a system to creation. There's a science to the creation. There's a science that we could discover that's deeper and deeper to the creation. 
That's all part of the creation. So getting present to the idea of creation is really, really important to get into any of the narrative of the Torah. It's a radical idea. It's not really a radical idea. It actually makes, to me, more sense today than any other idea. That, number one, we're limited beings. We're creatures of a certain form. We're designed in a particular way. And part of our design does not allow us to see the fact that we're happening all the time. That every moment that we exist, we are being recreated. We have a difficult time getting present with that because our mind does not wrap itself around this idea, at least at first. Through deductive reasoning, through the absence of other, other ideas that have been put forth by judging them with truth, asking questions with integrity, one has an easier time to get into this conversation, which by the way, is the conversation of Kabbalah, that everything is energy. And our experience of that energy is exactly the way we are designed to be experiencing it. So that's foundation number one. Foundation number two, the design of the world, the design of the purpose, the design and the purpose of the world is all aligned with an original desire. But before I get to the original desire of our maker, I need to make a very, very important point. Often in the Torah, we see how the Torah says, and God, or Yudhei, one of God's names, Yudhei Vavay, spoke to Moses saying, who's saying that? And if it's God himself saying that, then why didn't the Torah say, and why doesn't the Torah say, and I spoke to Moses saying, what's up with his alter ego? But in here lay a very, very important secret that's described to us again through the teachings of Kabbalah, that there is the essence of the creator which is beyond any conversation. One cannot fathom it. It's, 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 it's the moment we attempt to fathom what the essence of our maker is, it's already a, 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 depreci a, a, a depreciated value of what the truth is because it's impossible. What we do know is the, so to speak, with all due respect, the alter ego that the maker puts forth, which is infinite, which is timeless, which is responsible for time and space, through which we communicate with our maker, at least in most of this reality. Yes, we do have the possibility to reach beyond anything that has any definition and speak to our maker. That's a very powerful component that we've been given and we can initiate in prayer. But let's get back to Noah and the story. There's a desire that the maker has. We cannot understand why, but we know what it is because we're taught it through the Torah. That there should be a universe that has very, very diminished uh, light of the infinite light. In other words, the way that this reality experiences its reality is in the confines of nature, is in the confines of time, space, and energy. And there should be creatures that have free choice and those free choice creatures being made of the, of the, of the one and in a way that we can't understand where nothing in this world is absence of that one, but nevertheless being completely in concealment from being able to see that present in our lives, being given the tools, the Torah, to discover the infinite light within us and activating it through our free choice. And that's the desire of our maker that when we activate our free choice, then we bring about the purpose of why we are here. The ultimate of that will be when all of this gets revealed and the curtains come down, Mashiach now. So the story of, the story of Noah and the story of the Torah of telling us of Noah is really very much letting us know how the system works. There's a system to it. Just like there's a system to nature, there's a system to the universe, there's a spiritual system of cause and effect. It's a one that we can read about today and we can understand. And last but not least, when it came time for the Jewish people to pursue the return back to the Holy Land of Israel, there was a great deal of history that took place before 1948. 
There was one story where Ben Gurion, who was a secular Jew, who was a, a Zionist, who was meeting with several of the European and other leaders who were saying to him, what right do you have to this land? They pulled out contracts 700 years old from Arabs saying they have contracts to this land. Show us yours. And of course, what a silly thing to say. <laughs> you kicked us out of the land. You persecuted us. You destroyed any remnants that you could of our existence there. Now you're asking us for proof. And nothing could shake them. And he couldn't. And finally, Ben Gurion did something that was unfathomable. Unfath unfathomable. I don't know. I'm not going to say that. He pulled out a Torah. They were believers in the book of Moses. And he said, Do you believe this book is true? And they said, We do. And he said, In this book, we are given, the Jewish people were given the holy land of Israel to dwell. And that's what changed the argument. Rabbi Lau, who was the chief rabbi of Israel, turned to Ben-Gurion at one point and said, is this tr story true? He said, absolutely. And he asked him, how could it be that something of such value that gave you legitimacy to the Holy Land of Israel is treated so poorly? Like it's like, it's, like it's like something of the old. That was what you used. So here's my point. There are a lot of questions that we have about the story of Noah. They're all reasonable questions and they're all addressed. And it's important, this is part of the study of Torah, is we question. That's exactly what gets us to the next level. We read about it, we get frustrated with it. We become perhaps sometimes cynical about it. And then we're pulled and moved to the next level to understand there's something deeper going on. The deeper part of it that was going on was that this creature became so corrupt that it could no longer serve the purpose of why the creator created this world. It had to have a new form. They were people that were no longer behaving as humans. They were behaving as wild animals. And there was nothing that could influence them, including the fact that Noah was there for 120 years telling them that the maker of our universe is in communication with him and saying to him, this is not the way that we're meant to be. But at the same time, we have free choice. That's the design. So I encourage yourself to look deeper and go to the Chabad.org website and look at the Parsha of Noach. Look at the Hasidic insights, the Kabbalistic insights. And I assure you, you'll take it to the next level and you'll be able to look back and say, wow, what a great journey from frustration to enlightenment. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi Yonan. <laughs> so it's, it's obvious that we haven't come to a conclusion. No. A conclusion no. about that at all. We've come to another question. Which is the way that we do things as Jews. I got it. <laughs> you know, they, they say, um, why do Jewish people answer questions with a question? Why? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And so in um, yeshiva, um, you learned how to ask questions? Yes, we were encouraged to. Yeah. And that, that's one of the beauties of Jewish education, is we're encouraged to look at the, the answer that's given, for example, in the Talmud, and find a problem with the answer. See, why, so what's wrong with that answer? Because usually what that brings you to is actually the real answer, what you read, which you didn't understand the first time. Hmm. Get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, it's, it's a, so, so in, in, in the more spiritual esoteric teachings, the question is seen as the vessel. The question is a vessel for new light to emerge. And not only that, but one of the beautiful things that goes on spiritually, but is uh, uses a meta metaphor physically in our, in our communication that when a teacher and a student clash, that produces a possibility for something that didn't exist yet. So it's a, build, it's a, it's a possibility of a new vessel, of a new something, you know, of a new light, actually, of a new something, even an understanding that the teacher themselves didn't think about. 
because of the fact that the student asked the question. So it's um, that's why it says um, the the Mishnah tells us someone who's embarrassed to ask can't learn. Someone who is uh, not who's frustrated and doesn't like to ask and doesn't like to answer questions should not be a teacher. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, our time is up today. Um, I'm glad I asked the question. Uh, and I hope at least I somewhat brought yeah, at least uh, some light onto the matter. No, I, I thought your response was a beautiful response. Thank you. And uh, there wasn't a bit of um, defensiveness in it. There was certainty in it. And um, it's obviously a question that you've been posed many, many, many times. And that's been posed in your education as a Jew many, many times. And probably this has been one of the simpler questions that have been raised, but that's the level of my involvement in the questions about being a Jew. And so my willingness to um, show evidence of my superficiality when it comes to Torah um, is simply an evident evidence that I'm seriously determined to pursue this conversation that we're in. All right, and, and before we say goodbye, I just, I want to just point out one thing that comes to mind now, is that for me, I, I've always had a lot of questions. I still do, I have a lot of questions, but the, the questions, I asked the question you asked when I was younger, to understand it, you know? One of the things that I've come to my own journey, because of the fact that eventually I got to a deeper answer and I got to a beautiful answer on many, so many different matters. Uh, so then I, I come to realize that there's a 3,330 something year old chain over here that most of the questions that we have, they were asked. They were answered sufficiently to the degree that the chain wasn't broken. I mean, if I were if I if I were part of that, if I were in in in, in a higher upper link of that chain, let's say, and, and I and I, nobody had an answer for me on certain of these important questions, I may have checked out. You know what I'm saying? So I, I I lean on the fact that some really really wise people, so many of them, beautiful righteous people, wise ones, they got through this question and answer. I, that's not enough for me. I want to learn it, but it's enough for me to trust it, to trust the journey, if, if that makes sense. You know. I got it. Thank you, Levy. Thank you. Have a great day. Love you. You too. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.